Good morning, everyone. I'm Christine Nicholas, the chair of the New York State Tourism Advisory Council, and I'd like to, uh, to call the meeting in person and, of course, welcome our friends on Zoom to order. It is now 11.06 a.m. Uh, we'll start by taking attendance uh, for those calling in first. I'll call the names from the RSVP list that I have here. So on the call, we are expecting Tom Mulroy. Okay, Catherine Nichols. Good morning. Good morning. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel. Elena Petroselli. Thurman Thomas. And Anthony Davidovitz. I hope he was away. Okay. All right. I think they may call in a little li later. But then we also have some uh, members on the Zoom. Um, Dan Fuller. Good morning. Good morning. That's Assemblyman, welcome. Why, thank you, Christine. It's lovely to be with you even on a camera. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you love the camera. <laughs> there are some people who claim the camera loves me. It's not a mutually loving relationship. That's all I'll say. <laughs> well, we're happy to have you. There's someone from the senator's office. Um, is there anybody else? It's hard. We don't have the name, so... Please introduce yourself, Alexis. Hi, my Alexis. name is Mandy Heller. I'm here from Senator Serrano's office. Welcome. Good morning, Alexis Sinclair from United Airlines. Hi. Hi. All right, so now we will we'll introduce well, our tech team. Ross? Yes. Hi, I'm Ross Levi. I'm the executive director of the New York State Division of Tourism and a vice president here at Empire State Development. Rich Gagliano, SVP Marketing at ESD. Tom Martinelli, Content Studio, New York by Rail. Greg. Greg Marshall, I'm founder of Genesee Journeys. Today I'm representing Visit Rochester and Wine, Water and Wonders of Upstate New York. And good morning. I'm Nan Marchand, your guest today, and I'm with the U.S. Travel Association. <clears throat> And I'm Georgine Tim with the New York City Marriott Hotels. <coughs> and I'm Eleanor Tatum of TAC. I'm David Filipiak. I'm the Director of Tourism Partnerships at Photographiska New York. Ellery Knobloch, Ontario County and Finger Lakes. Shanique Kostin, Vice President of Experiential Marketing with I Love New York. Sarah Emmert, Director of Tourism Policy Initiatives at I Love New York. And um, Rowena Sukuli, former um, I Love New York. Team member, yeah. Team member, yeah. <laughs> Very exciting. We have room for you at the table. Oh, okay. Come on, join us. Um, so to our friends and members who are on the Zoom, no offense. Oh, hi, Tom. Tom Mulroy nice joined us. Uh, we're just going to put you on mute. Um, but if you do want to speak, you can um, raise your hand or unmute, and we'll, we'll recognize that. Um, so all the members have been emailed a copy of the minutes, and they're also available on the EST website. If there are any changes to the minutes, please do so. Make yourself known. Any changes proposed? Okay, then I need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Eleanor Tatum, and I need a second. Second. I'll do my first second. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries, minutes are approved. Um, so, as I said before, very, very happy to be back in person uh, from Midtown Manhattan. Um, and since our last TAC meeting, I attended two industry events, uh, the first being NYC and Company's annual meeting held at the Javits Center on March 30th. I did I miss a page? Oh my goodness, I did. There you go. I feel like um, who was the one that missed the pages? That I was guess. us. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. A lot of pressure being back in person. I know. Right? I know. Yeah. A lot of know. practice. Uh, well, all right. I'm, I'm all good. You're good. We'll, we'll make it through. We will make it through. So just as a, uh, we were talking about this earlier, our last in-person meeting was in February of 2020, right before the shutdown. And those of you who might not remember, it was here in our in our offices at ESD. Uh, we had Deborah Hughes from the Susan B. Anthony House discuss the organization's plans for the 200th anniversary of the Susan B. Anthony's birth 
Unfortunately, um, we all remember what happened next. Um, there's no doubt that the last two years have been a transformative and difficult time for the industry. But as we move forward in recovery, it's encouraging to be back together in person and talking about what the state is doing to welcome travelers back and help revitalize the tourism industry. For my report today, I want to briefly highlight some recent industry activities and tourism related announcements and budget updates. So first, I want to start with a very special announcement to welcome a new TAC member to our meeting, George and Tim. Uh, George is the Market Director of Diplomatic and Community Relations for the New York City Marriott Hotels and a key emissary of the general managers of all New York City Marriott Hotels. George's specialized responsibilities range from cultivating relationships with dignitaries, celebrities, and other VIP guests to working with local and national government agencies to assist the hotels in their operations within the community. George is also the immediate past chair of, of the board of the New York State Hospitality and Tourism Association, the oldest lodging association in the country. For the past 20 years, he served as the adjunct professor of hotel operations at New York University's uh, Tisch Center for Hospitality and Tourism Management, as well as a special advisor to several governments in Africa and the Caribbean. Governor Hochul appointed George on April 27th to succeed Ali Sirota, and we thank Ali for all of her service to TAC. So George, we welcome you to TAC. Well, thank you so much. And uh, as you know, Christine, I've been uh, participating in your meetings, even though I wasn't officially a board member. So I look forward to working with all of you and uh, share some uh, great ideas. So thank Perfect. you. Welcome, welcome George. Welcome, George. So since um, the last TAC meeting, I had the pleasure of attending two industry events, the first being NYC and Company's annual meeting held at the Javits Center on March 30th. I was joined by Ross at that event. Um, this was NYC and Company's first in-person annual meeting in three years, and they announced the launch of a new marketing campaign called Get Local NYC. This new campaign features travel guides on each of the city's five boroughs, giving travelers a sense of place from the perspective of a local New Yorker. Mayor Eric Adams was in attendance to launch the campaign as part of his Rebuild, Renew, Reinvent, a blueprint for New York City's economic recovery. Governor Hochul sent a video message supporting the work to bring the city back to its record levels of tourism. The meeting was also featured, also featured the release of a new um, data regarding the city's <clears throat> tourism recovery, forecasting that in 2022, the number should expect to reach 85% of the 2019 levels. David was there as well. Oh yes, you were there too, of course. Wonderful. Great, it was a it was a very good meeting. I mean, they had about 800 people there. Seemed like, yeah. Pretty robust. Um, I also had the uh, opportunity to attend the New York State Tourism Industry Association's annual conference in Westchester, the end of April. I was joined, Greg was there as well. Um, you were there as well, right? I think there was a lot of rich. You were there, Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. It's, it's great. So, you know, we've been together, <laughs> but not here. Um, but now we are. Um, this year's conference theme was on transformational tourism stewardship and featured discussion from Roger Dow, president and CEO of U.S. Travel, Andreas Weisenborn, the destinations of Destinations International, um, former I Love New York executive director Gavin Landry from Visit Britain and the annual I Love New York update from Ross, which was very well received. It was great to attend both events and to hear all the exciting updates from our industry partners and how each region is handling recovery. The governor has announced some new tourism related infrastructure and funding projects, starting with the new state park unveiling in Kingston. In recognition of Black History Month and Women's History Month, the governor announced plans for the new state park to commemorate the legacy of 19th century, let's see, look at this. If I miss this page, it was going to be <laughs> recognition of 19th century beverages. <laughs> you know, double -sided. Say, uh, 19th century. I'm going to read that over so that for the record, you're going to have to do a little bit of editing here. <laughs> so it's not 19th century beverages. Here we go. Okay. We're getting there. <laughs> in recognition of Black History Month and Women's History Month, the governor announced plans for the new state park to commemorate 
the legacy of the 19th century African-American abolitionist and suffragist Sojourner Truth. The park opened in April 23rd, on April 23rd, and sits on more than 500 acres of former industrial property along the Hudson River shoreline. This is the first state park in the city of Kingston and the first new state park to open since July of 2019. Included in this year's budget is an additional 3.5 million to design additional park improvements, including commissioning artwork. In April, the governor also unveiled the new rooftop farm at the Javits Center. Located more than eight stories above street level, the new one acre working farm was completed last year as part of a 1.2 million square foot state of the art expansion of the Javits Center on Manhattan's west side. Each year, the farm is expected to generate up to 40,000 pounds of produce, which is being incorporated into the millions of meals served to the guests during the events at the convention center. This new feature also joined the state's grown and certified program, which identifies local producers who adhere to higher standards of food safety and environmental stewardship. Since last, since we last met in March, the new state budget was passed by the legislature. Ross will give an update later on his, in his report on how I Love New York has um, specifically been represented there. Um, but I'd like to go over a few other tourism related budget items outside the division of tourism. The newly enacted 2022 to 23 budget increased funding for the state parks by $140 million to a total of $250 million. This will be invested into enhanced and improving New York state parks. The substantial level of funding will aid the ongoing transformation of New York's flagship parks and support critical infrastructure projects throughout the park system. The budget also included passage of policy allowing restaurants to sell alcoholic beverages to go for off-premises consumption. To go drinks were critical, uh, a critical revenue stream for New York bars and restaurants during the pandemic, helping many small businesses across the state pay their rent or mortgages. This measure will continue supporting the continued recovery of bars and restaurants. The new policy addresses the concerns of small businesses operating liquor stores by requiring food orders, sealed containers, and no bottle sales. The budget includes 105 million in new capital funding for the Olympic Regional Development Authority, including 92.5 million for a strategic upgrade and modernization plan to support improvements to the Olympic facilities and ski resorts with a focus of um, preparation for the Lake Placid 2023 Winter World University Games. Additional investments in these North Country assets. Um, wait a second. Yeah, we'll continue to make the state more competitive for winter recreation and travel, um, attracting large sports events, and ultimately driving year-round businesses, uh, business and economic uh, sustainability for the area. The budget includes 600 million in capital funding to support construction of a new 1.4 billion stadium under the joint public-private agreement to ensure that the Buffalo Bills remain in New York State for the next 30 years. The budget includes an extension and enhancement of the New York City musical and theatrical production tax credit to further support this sector in the wake of the impact of the pandemic on these performances. Additionally, the budget includes $140 million in historic funding for the New York State Council on the Arts, which includes recovery funds, capital projects, support, and grants. That's $90 million in grant opportunities available to our artists and cultural organizations across the state that are now available with more information about applying for funding on uh, Nishka's website. And that concludes my reports. Are there any questions? Check the, um, I don't know, Catherine, do you want to go into the grants at all or do you want to add anything to that? The nine grant opportunities? I'm sorry, sorry, I just unmuted you and I missed what your, your last point, just, sorry. Um, just with all of the additional grant opportunities. For NISCA. For NISCA. Yeah, for NISCA, yes. I mean, we're extremely grateful and um, extend thanks to Senator Serrano and Assemblyman O'Donnell for their leadership and support. Um, base budget uh, remains at 40 million and we're very grateful for <clears throat> the extension of the recovery budget as well as the generous capital budget uh, for fiscal 2023. Mm -hmm. 
Terrific. Great. No other questions. I will hand it over to Ross for your update for I Love New York. Thank you. Well, great to be back with everybody in person. <laughs> as much fun as it was being in boxes with all of you on screens, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, my colleague Sarah Emmer, who uh, made this in meeting possible, at least logistically, uh, ably filling in uh, for Kelly Garofalo Wilkins, we all know and love. And I think everyone knows this on maternity leave, uh, having had a boy. A, a boy. Yep. Yeah, um, so. so now it's a match set. Oh, gosh. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so we're excited um, for her. And we're thankful for Sarah for pitching in, in the thank meantime. You, so thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, as uh, Christine alluded to, uh, the budget beyond what you saw, which was the non Empire State Development Division of Tourism budget items, um, as far as tourism specifically, basically uh, the Division of Tourism and ESD are back to where we were uh, in terms of uh, our funding levels, back to pre COVID levels. So that's pretty great. Um, that breaks down to about 47.5 million for all of ESD's marketing work, which includes, of course, I Love New York, 3.5 million for matching funds, the money that goes to our tourism promotion agencies for the work they're doing on the local and regional levels, uh, and then 15 million for the Market New York Competitive Program, which you've heard about in years past, uh, 7 million for marketing working capital projects, 8 million for capital projects, that's that competitive program. Um, that I'll be talking about a little later in my report. One thing to note is in addition to that state funding, as you've heard at previous meetings, uh, we also, you'll remember, received $44.9 million from the federal government through the Economic Development Administration uh, and the Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation State Grant. Um, and that is uh, money that we're able to spend over the next three years. That is over and above the state funding that we get. Um, and with that, that will give us, again, over three years, 20.5 million for I Love New York programmatic work, uh, $8 million to go to some sister state agencies, specifically uh, state parks and the State Department of Environmental Conservation um, to, do, uh, to help support our outdoor recreation work. Um, and then 14.25 million, which we will be competitively sub-granting to DMOs uh, across the state and uh, CVBs. I'll be talking more about that uh, later in my report. Um, though uh, we are very happy that the ESD board approved the guidelines for that competitive grant program. So that allows that to move ahead. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of the budget picture of where we are now. Bottom line, uh, we're in good shape with resources. Uh, good to be back where we were in terms of state funding. Um, and then with that additional federal money allowing us to do work uh, that we haven't done before. So that's exciting. In terms of what we've been doing at I Love New York since our last meeting, um, we uh, are getting ready for our summer advertising. Um, the television uh, plan to launch in late May, early June. Rich tells me if this meeting was uh, another week later, we'd be, we'd be able to show you looking at a lot of great stuff. But you'll hopefully be seeing see it. Hopefully, you'll be seeing it on your screens at home in the next couple of weeks, um, and then certainly at the next TAC meeting, as we always do. Um, so we'll be excited to be back on air for summer. Um, we've been doing a, a good amount of international work, actually teeing things up as people are returning to the U.S. Uh, we hosted an Ireland fam tour uh, from April fifteenth through the twenty first. Uh, Platinum Travel, which is an award-winning travel agency in Ireland uh, with over 30 years of experience in the industry, uh, sent their award-winning travel TV presenter Ed Finn on a tour showcasing attractions and lodging uh, through the Hudson Valley and the Catskills, Central New York, Finger Lakes, and the Greater Niagara region. Uh, we engaged with Platinum on a partnership to create a 15-minute video about the unique experiences for travelers to enjoy on a road trip through New York State. Uh, and so while they were here, they captured content, uh, which was shared with their social media following, uh, and will produce the final product in the next few months, which will be broadcast over 50,000 consumers in Ireland. Uh, we also uh, were supporting uh, Delta Airlines um, with a uh, effort with Belgium. Uh, visit Belgium, visit USA Belgium, Delta Airlines Belgium, and the US Commercial Services held a travel to the US relaunch event 
for the industry at the residence of the U.S. ambassador to Belgium. Uh, and I Love New York sent a pre-recorded message from me, uh, which was played at the ambassador's residence as part of that event, uh, where the ambassador, the def deputy chief of the mission, and 45 others were in attendance. You can see the picture there on the, on the PowerPoint. Uh, speaking of airlines, we have been uh, getting ready for Play Airlines, uh, which is providing new service from Iceland uh, to Stewart Airport in the Hudson Valley. Uh, that's not only from Iceland, though, that actually has connections uh, from other European destinations. So um, they're going to be commencing that daily service on June 8th. Um, and so uh, we have been uh, working with Play, the Port Authority, uh, and TP, our TPA partners in the Hudson Valley to facilitate and promote that service, uh, as well as uh, the Hudson Valley in New York City for vacation. So you'll remember we did this for Norwegian Air. Whenever there's kind of a new service to New York, we want to be able to maximize that as much as we can. Um, and then also in the international realm, uh, IPW, many of you know, is upon us, um, at least in another few weeks, uh, June 4th through the 8th in Orlando. I Love New York will be returning for an in-person presence there with a booth slightly scaled down from our height pre-COVID, but uh, good to be back anyway with some partners that will be there with us. Uh, Mark Lee Wilson, our uh, Director of International Tourism, will be heading up to the booth. Uh, so we can do those meetings with tour operators. I'll be joining him for the second day of those meetings. The first day I will be with Finn Partners, our PR agency, at the Media Marketplace uh, meeting with journalists. So um, we will be meeting with both journalists and tour operators from particularly our key markets, UK, Canada, Germany, and Australia, and some other as well. But we, we try to limit ourselves to where we have the standing presence to have the most bang for our buck. Um, I want to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing in segment tourism. Um, first, uh, on Path Through History, uh, we were able to uh, maximize a partnership with the Museum Association of New York as part of their annual conference, April 12th through uh, 9th through the 12th, which was held in Corning. Um, and that gave us the opportunity to have a Path Through History booth uh, to promote the program. Um, and uh, it's a great opportunity for us uh, to have the heritage and historic community together. Uh, and we are able to talk to them about the Path Through History program, encourage them uh, to sign up to be a Path Through History site, uh, to participate in Path Through History events. Um, and uh, we also had Matt in their conference program and uh, on their website and other benefits throughout the year as part of that partnership. Um, also with Path Through History, we're getting ready for the Spring Path Through History Weekend, which is coming up June 18th through the 19th. That's Father's Day weekend. Um, also with our sites to the one in fall, uh, October 4th through the 6th. Uh, but already for the spring weekend, we have 58 events signed up uh, at 40, I'm sorry, 51 different sites uh, across New York State. Um, those are a combination of live and virtual events. Uh, you'll remember we went to virtual exclusively during COVID. Um, but the, and the response was doing a mix was actually very helpful because even though obviously the virtual doesn't get the visitors there in person, which is our long term goal, it gives exposure to these sites that they otherwise wouldn't have gets people interested in visiting. Um, so we allow uh, both, uh, uh, both alive and in person. Um, themes uh, this year include everything from civil rights and indigenous people's history to arts and culture and military history. Um, there are several Juneteenth celebrations currently six of them actually to date. Um, and so we'll be promoting those events in the Path Through History Weekend um, with dedicated I Love New York blog posts, social media posts, a newsletter feature, and a dedicated press pitch. Um, and we actively are encouraging his heritage and historic sites to become part of the Path Through History program. Uh, if they are, they not only get the, the sort of year round promotion of their site. But whenever they do events, even outside these weekends, we promote those events on the Path Through History calendar. So if any of you um, work with any heritage or historic sites who aren't currently Path Through History sites, uh, we encourage them to go to the Isle of New York website, check out the criteria. We'd love to have them join uh, that segment. June is a busy month for us, not only getting ready for summer, not only Path Through History, but of course, it's Pride Month, LGBTQ Pride Month. And after a two-year hiatus, I Love New York LGBTQ is reactivating at in-person Pride events. Uh, we'll be engaging LGBTQ consumers across New York State. Uh, we're hoping to have a presence at Pride events throughout June and actually throughout the summer. Some of them uh, go into July. Um, right now, we're hoping to be at uh, Buffalo, Albany, Rochester, Harlem, New York City, Fire Island, and Rochester. 
and we stay flexible for other opportunities that come up. But so far, that's the core. Uh, we've worked with our experiential team, Shanique and her team, who you'll be hearing from momentarily, um, to reimagine the experience at these Pride events. Um, and this year, uh, our activation is including uh, an aura photography reading, where people will have their their energy, their aura red. I just had mine done cool. last week. You okay. did, yeah. honest to God. Good. It's okay. very insightful. And We're trending. That's I good. That's my secret. <laughs> good. Uh, and the way it's working is once people do the reading, based on their reading, we're going to be recommending specific, specific travel recommendations mm -hmm. to nice. match their personality. That's yeah. pretty cool. As That's you know at these events, first. yeah. I mean, as you know at these events, it's about being fun and I won't say gimmicky, but at least getting people's attention with new and novel uh, so that people are talking. Um, so we're excited for it. Um, in addition to our activation at the events, we're backing that up uh, to make sure the I Love New York LGBTQ webpage, uh, our landing page is all up to date. We have uh, new blogs. Uh, we're featuring social media promotions during Pride Month. Uh, we recently published an updated I Love New York LGBTQ printed travel guide. Um, and other promotional materials to incorporate new travel destinations and attractions and update to reflect changes and evolutions in the LGBTQ community. For example, we just last year became I Love New York LGBTQ instead of I Love New York LGBT. <laughs> um, so yes, it'll be a busy uh, month uh, with all that. Um, it's a busy month for the entire uh, I Love New York uh, and ESD marketing team. Um, that includes our experiential team as they begin uh, their summer tour. And we're thrilled to have uh, my colleague Shanique Costin here at Reds Up, <coughs> our experiential marketing team, to give folks a sneak preview of that. Yeah, um, it is a busy month indeed. We will be launching our I Love New York mobile tour um, for the new members um, who are joining us. The mobile tour has been in existence for about five or six years now. Um, it used to be uh, affectionately known as the pod tour. Um, and that was more a kind of homage to the vehicle itself. Um, we are completely reimagining the experience um, that will kick off actually in the month of June. Um, and uh, it is now moving to a 30 by 30 footprint. Um, that will really allow for space and engagement and activity in a really safe way. Uh, we are only launching with one vehicle. Um, some of you may remember our pod tour used to have two vehicles, um, just kind of giving uh, us going back into the space. Um, we're actually seeing uh, our large scale events, which we participate in third party events are still coming back online, kind of given what's happening with the pandemic. Um, so a lot of our um, stops aren't necessarily back in full force, but the ones that are, we certainly want to have a presence at. And so we'll be launching with one tour. There'll be about 16 stops on this main part of the tour. Um, 11 are in state, five are out of state. Um, out of state are usually in our drive, our drive time markets or drivable markets, uh, which include New Jersey, Connecticut, and Canada is our international market. Um, in addition, um, the footprint is fully connective, um, and for folks in the event space, you will fully understand this. Um, prior to in our old pod experience, um, we collect leads. We still collect leads as part of one of our major metrics here, um, and those leads actually go over to our uh, email database, which helps our digital team continue the conversations with potential uh, travelers. And so. Um, each of our interactions used to have kind of an email sign up. And so if you were in our old footprint, we probably used to have about four, three to four interactions. And so you'd have to put your email in each time. Um, it's a little bit of a pain point for us. And so um, I certainly made an admission to see if we could figure out what that looks like. And happy to announce we have figured it out with what we're calling single sign on. Um, essentially, you submit your email once into this experience through a digital registration. And that digital registration creates a unique QR code that will follow you throughout the entire footprint. So instead of needing to put your email in, you'll literally just scan your QR code from your mobile device. Um, and that will allow you to unlock each of the interactions. Um, we can go on to the next one. These two are just um, some uh, renders for you guys. You can see much larger scale uh, for us again. Uh, four interaction zones that I'll go into in a second. Um, you can go to the next one. Just a kind of aerial kind of version of it. 
um, more colorful, bringing in a lot of our photography and imagery um, points. And in terms of our uh, interaction zones, there'll be four, our four main interaction zones um, this year, including our Isle of New York, or with, in addition to our Isle of New York sculpture and our literature displays. Um, one will be um, a, what we're calling, so actually the name has changed since I submitted these slides. It's called Virtual, uh, virtual New York State. It's an augmented reality uh, experience, which can you go back one slide to the, that circular table in the middle? Essentially, we'll have um, be cut into 11 slices, each representing a region with three sculptures. Each of those sculptures you'll be able to scan with the QR code and they'll come to life. I'm giving you more about the region and those particular sculptures, but each region will also have a regional video because we know that the regions are more than just three sculptures, so to speak, our three attractions. Um, in addition, there is our 360 GIF platform, which the young lady in the yellow skirt is standing on. Um, essentially, you can either take a GIF uh, video with the I Love New York backdrop or 11 uh, virtual backdrops. One will be representing each region. Um, on the sides of uh, the 360 GIF are our kiosk experience. They will house our insider tips as well as our map app. Um, our insider tips are uh, what we're calling this year our ability to give consumers um, kind of a double click down um, and let them understand or give them kind of if you travel or want to travel, right, here are the tips and tricks that the locals know, right, that will make your experience more and more enhanced one. So stuff like kind of what's the best time to see the sunset over Niagara. And um, if you go to this specific uh, uh, attraction, i.e. one of the water parks after three o'clock, you can actually use that same pass to get in free the next day. So it's giving them little tips and tricks about, um, again, enhancing their travel experience as they're thinking about planning their next vacation. Um, all of that then culminates in our prizing wheel, which is off to the left. Um, essentially, if you do the AR experience or the insider's tips, if you engage with at least four of those regions, um, it will unlock our prizing wheel. You, you'll get to get some free swag from I Love New York. Essentially, we've gated it in a way that allows folks, we want to encourage folks to go deep in the understanding of what New York State has to offer. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there. It's cool. crazy. I just wanted to make a quick point. As Ross mentioned before, more to follow on the overall holistic I Love New York campaign. But since this is the first element that we're able to go into some detail on, I just wanted to give an extra shout out to Shanique and the entire I Love New York team for pulling this together. Um, not only is the mobile tour always a, a huge effort to put together, but imagine it building it from scratch in a world where we're not necessarily post-COVID, maybe less COVID, during COVID, but there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of scheduling and dealing with the people to run it and building of all these activities. So I just wanted to point out a little extra shout out to the team for pulling this together. We wish you could share with the entire campaign and all the elements together, but more to follow on the overall holistic campaign, but this is a huge, huge piece of it. And I was pleased to get a call from Pierre Luke about them coming through the area and so they're touching base with the local TPAs to make sure that they understand the region uh, well. And so I was glad to get that call and we're looking forward to hosting them. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we actually have what I call our rock star crew um, from 2019 returning, which is a huge deal. Um, they were, um, I, I credit them so much with the, um, how well and successful the 2019 tour was and to get four of them. We had eight that year, but since we're only putting one tour back on the road this year, um, we had four return. We actually had more than four return, but given some logistical challenges, um, some had to drop and are going to our other programs like LGBTQ and some of our other ad activations, but um, having them back, I think will mean the world to everyone. And um, they are connecting with the local TPAs to understand more about the region and go deep this time. So, how, how do you measure success with the tour in terms of actual, I guess, conversion to visits? That, um, I don't, we don't, we can't really track in that regard, like uh, conversions to visits. This, this specific activation um, will allow us to track a lot more though. So um, as Rich was mentioning, um, this was totally a 
group effort and we are connected not only digitally through the single sign on we're also tracking folks in terms of visiting the i love new york website and that kind of thing so we'll be able to track more of um kind of where you are in the funnel so to speak um in terms in, in addition to having your email and being able to communicate with you we'll know which attractions which interactions within the footprint um were of interest to you which ones you explored more by region um so we can serve up specific content for you um kind of on the follow-up through our digital channels around uh, Greater Niagara or Rochester area. That is kind of there thing. any ability anywhere in there for people to actually go in and buy tickets or anything? We don't. I mean, in general, I love New York. We are not in the product selling or in the product promoting business. Right. So, but yeah. is there a way for people like because, you know, a lot of these things are impulsive. Yes. Right. And so if they're somewhere and say you're in a area in a, in a local area. Right. And if they say, oh, this looks really cool and we're nearby there right now. Is there a way that they could be able to buy a ticket for an attraction that would be nearby? A lot of what we do, almost everything we do drives back to I love New York .com. So it's right. a combination of that. And the brand ambassador, if someone's really interested in something, the brand ambassador will be trained on saying, oh, here's how to go to buy a ticket to this thing that you just express interest in. Or if you're on your own, we point to the website, whether we're pointing people back to New York City and Co. to actually book a hotel or to attraction X, Y, or Z to buy a ticket or make a reservation. The website's designed in a way to not necessarily take you deeper into our experience too quick as when you feel relevant, when you feel it's the right time to go up and buy, to then shoot you off to make the purchase. Because Ross said, we don't really- Okay, so we'll click, you can click to their website. Oh, the, yes, okay. yes. I just wanted to make sure that you're not oh, specifically right. in the footprint because right. of security measures and wanting to take folks off of ilovenewyork.com. That's just a security feature for us. Someone is in a, let's say you're you're surfing on one of our uh, kiosks and someone pulls something right, up well, inappropriately. Not the kiosk, yeah. but, but overall, since we point you to .com, .com right, will that's, take you. That's the ultimate purpose of I love yeah. is to give as much deep information as we can possibly have, but to allow people to make their own journey when they want. If they're ready to purchase, we don't want to keep you on our site. We don't. We don't. You know. We don't find. We don't measure success in time on site. We want people to spend as much time right. as possible if that's what they want. But if they want to quickly see a quick blurb of something and go buy a ticket to Legoland or a ticket to wherever, get them there. But the point is not to design a website to keep you deep in it, but allow you to kind of exit and enter at the most relevant point to make those to make those purchases. And in addition to tracking, you know, we, we, we survey people who come through to understand their overall satisfaction with it. We capture leads that we put into our overall lead database. This is also, like I said before, part of the overall arching I Love New York campaign, which we track with the overall with the constantly market brand tracker. That's the report that comes out once a year that shows the overall consideration levels of those who are aware of our campaign. And our campaign is not just the TV spots. It's the mobile tour, the TV, the digital, the events, the appearances, anything under the umbrella of I Love New York fits under that umbrella of the New York I Love New York campaign, which is measured holistically by that tracker. Are you asking the partners that you have links to to report back to you at the periods during time to find out how many, what the response is from the websites, how they're, what kind of traffic they're yeah, getting. We're in uh, constant feedback with the TPAs, with the regions, with the tractions. You know, some of the, the, the feedback from them is anecdotal. Um, you know, some of it is, I'm sure if we're being, if we're driving a lot of, driving a lot of traffic to a specific attraction, you can hear about it. Yeah, we've like, heard that on specific campaigns. It's an interesting idea to think about, you know, making sure that our partners are aware even beyond the TPAs to let attractions know, hey, we're out there talking about you. If you hear anything, let us know. It's an interesting idea. Well, Should even if their websites, I'm sorry, even mm -hmm. from their websites getting that information because it is, you know, on Google Analytics, they can find right. out where right. they're getting where they're their traffic from. from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. This is really wonderful and interactive. I'm curious, Russ, do you ever see a, a a version of this in the future to travel trade shows, uh, this colorful interactivity. Yeah, I mean, we, we've done that, for example, back when there was a New York Times travel show, that was the only consumer show we've done. And we've done this and more actually at those kinds of things. Um, now with the EDA money, we're actually looking at that again um, and going uh, again, I mean, in terms of going to consumer shows, are there ones that are particular to the new areas we're going into like outdoor recreation, um, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're constantly looking for opportunities. Even, even B2B though, I was the consumer, of course, but even B2B, like your the, yes. the, the travel agents from Ireland, I can see, totally get lost in that for, and have a good time drilling That's down. That's a good idea. Um, because so far our, our, uh, trade or B2B trade stuff has been much more, you know, 
a pretty backdrop type thing and functional for the meetings we're having there. But that's actually an interesting concept. Yeah, we should look at that. Great. Thank you, Shanine. Good job. Great, John. Um, in addition to experiential, uh, we are also uh, advertising in the segments that we already talked about. Um, our PR uh, work continues, of course. Uh, our next media night is coming up June 1st from 6 to 9 at the Museum of Natural History. Tech members will be getting an invitation soon. We'd love to see you there if you'd like to come. Um, it's This one is, is essentially a welcome back event uh, to show the world what New York State has to offer uh, and what press the press and travel journalists may have missed over the past couple of years um, and uh, we will have a couple of uh, experience areas some interactive areas there for travel journalists to participate in uh, one for family fun one for outdoor recreation one for the gilded age and uh, our history attractions in that area and one for the harriet tubman bicentennial um, so like i said stay tuned uh, for your invitation to that we'd love to see you there in addition to all our promotion and marketing work, of course, I Love New York is also working to support our industry. Um, one of the ways, one of the things we know is a huge issue is workforce development. Um, and so uh, we were happy to again partner with the New York State Department of Labor for a second year of uh, tourism specific virtual job fairs uh, ahead of the summer season. Uh, so far, DOL and I Love New York has hosted two virtual job fairs, one specifically for downstate. So that was New York City, Long Island, parts of the Hudson Valley. Uh, that was on April 19th and another one for the rest of the state on May 3rd. Uh, the April downstate job fair had 37 registered businesses attended uh, with jobs that they were offering, over 1,400 available jobs, no surprise, I guess, and 500 total job seekers. So that's, that's a pretty good uh, participation. Uh, the May Upstate event had 42 registered businesses, over 3,000 regional available jobs, and over 500 job seekers as well. Um, and the feedback so far overall is that businesses really appreciate the exposure uh, and the ability uh, for the state to host these virtual job fairs, uh, and that potential job seekers have good opportunities to connect one on one with businesses that they may not have considered applying to in the past. So it seems to be accomplishing the goal of at least doing some matchmaking there. Um, and so we're looking to continue this work with DOL and hopefully begin expanding to have tourism specific participation during future in person job fairs. This is so far for the last year has been virtual, not a surprise, uh, but they used to be in person. Uh, and now that we have this new relationship with DOL, we hope that we'll be able to follow into IRL, right, in real life um, as, as these move in that direction. Uh, I also was able to attend the opening day of Legoland, uh, one of our crown jewel attractions. Um, and <coughs> official opening day. Their, their official <laughs> opening day, right? Uh, it, last year they kind of had a soft opening day. But this is like, this was a, their official first season open in New York State. Um, and so uh, I was there on April 8th um, and uh, was able to uh, help highlight the, some of the new things that they have coming up this year. They have a new water playground. They have some pretty cool holiday celebrations like a 4th of July fireworks and a bricker treat. Get it? Bricker treat Halloween celebration and a Christmas bricktacular um, and 4th of July fireworks I mentioned. They also have a new 4D movie experience uh, for those uh, holiday events. So a lot of cool things happening at Legoland. It was fun to be there. I also finally got to try the apple fries, which if you haven't heard, are strips of Granny Smith apple dipped in, I can't remember if it's waffle or pancake batter, deep fried with whipped cream and a caramel <laughs> dipping sauce. Are they good? They're as good as and they sound. Um. Where is it located? And it is in Goshen, New York, in the Hudson Valley, for those who don't remember. Right about Route 17. It an is the, the largest, hour. yeah, about an hour from New York City, uh, the largest Lego okay. land in the world. And is the it first fun? one in Northeast New York. It is fun. I did it in Orlando or um, Kids. I'd say Little. it's generally designed for like under 12. Yeah. Under 12. And, and adults, are New York, are New York and adults who feel like they're too old for it. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not if they like Legos. Um, do they have their technology? Are they doing technology with Lego like they do in Southern Cal? Or they will get there they where they're have, doing the interactive and the robotic Legos? It's not robotic. They do have a Lego lab where you yeah, go and you yeah. build things. Okay. And you get to It'll have your cars go down ramps and time them. And yeah, yeah it's a whole 
the whole thing. And, and one of the coolest things for all ages is they have uh, what's called Mini Land, which is uh, the United States in miniature. It's Lego models. Um, and particularly, they may pay very close attention to New York. They literally have downtown Goshen in Lego. Then you move to all five boroughs in, in depth, and then you start moving on into the rest of the United States. It's very cool. Um, and then the last thing I just want to talk about, uh, because it's so important to our industry so far, is our funding opportunity, some of which I've alluded to, but just to go into a little bit of detail and, and add to some I haven't mentioned. You'll remember at past meetings, uh, we talked about the governor's uh, announcement uh, of the um, Bring Back Jobs, Bring Back Tourism program, which was announced in November. Uh, a big part of that was the Tourism Return to Work and meet in New York grant programs. And on March 30th, the governor officially announced the launch of the applications for the $1 million tourism return to work program and the $25 million meet in New York grant programs. Um, so now they both have applications fully operational online for tourism businesses, convention centers, uh, licensed overnight facilities that qualify for the programs. So um, that's all available on the ESD website. Uh, lots of information on the application process. The deadline to submit applications for the Meet in New York are December 31st of this year, uh, and qualified businesses can apply for return to work grants between now and June of 2022. That's the application deadline. Uh, but for Meet in New York, you'll remember that is about uh, encouraging and incentivizing events to return to New York. The events can occur after that. Uh, it, that's not the deadline for the events to occur. Uh, but if you know of any hotels, convention centers, any event venues, that you think would want to have any discounts that they are providing on their meeting space underwritten by the state of New York, <clears throat> please send them to I Love New York, uh, uh, the ESD website to find out about Meet New York. Or if you know of any tourism business that is rehiring workers and expanding their numbers has to be a, a net add of workers, um, they should check on the return to work, return to work grant program because that will give them $5,000 for each new employee they hire full time. 2,500 for each part-time employee they hire. Obviously lots of restrictions, and I should say restrictions, lots of guidelines and requirements. Um, so by all means, check out the details on the websites. But the more you can help us spread the word, the better. Um, Meet New York, which you've heard about many years, has its round 12 this year. Um, and uh, applications were officially launched just on May 2nd. Um, that is, again, a $15 million program available, $7 million for marketing, $8 million for capital projects. Um, the idea is this is for both for-profit and non-profit businesses um, to either improve themselves in terms of capital projects, improvements to their facilities, um, or marketing programs, special events that they may bring. Um, and so uh, this is a matching funds program. 50% uh, match is required for marketing projects um, with a 25,000 minimum request. So anybody who has a project of 25,000 or more can apply um, and the state will match what they put in 50, uh, one to one, basically 50%. Um, and 80% match is required for capital projects with a 150,000 minimum request. So the deadline for both of these is July 29th of 2022, all applications must be in strictly by 5 p.m. on that date. Um, and then awards are expected to be announced in late fall. So again, uh, any help spreading the word for someone you think that would benefit from this program. Uh, and then uh, I alluded to uh, the EDA competitive sub awards. Those guidelines were approved by the ESD board on April 21st. Um, and so uh, what this is allowing us to do is take a good chunk, 14 million, of that money that we've received from the federal government and give it to our local partners so that they can do on the local level, uh, amplify what we're doing on the state level. The EDA projects we are focusing on are outdoor recreation, international tourism, and then the MICE meetings, conferences, exhibitions work, as well as amateur sports and group travel. So basically anything that falls into those broad categories is eligible uh, for the DMOs across New York State to apply for. Um, it is limited to DMOs and CVBs, um, and they can request for 250000 or more. Again, just like our grant, it can be spent over the three-year period. It doesn't have to be in a one-year period. Um, and uh, we'll be accepting applications for the program probably towards the end of June. But the guidelines are there now, so what we're encouraging partners to do is go look at the guidelines, start thinking about your project. You know what you're going to be judged on. You know what's uh, the criteria. And then you could actually put in your application toward the end of June 
uh, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to make those awards uh, towards uh, probably late summer, early fall. Um, and then uh, they can, like I said, those grants last through fall of 2025. So that concludes my <coughs> report. Uh, before I hand it over to our uh, special guest, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Russ, I have a quick question. Yes, uh, with the uh, Made in New York grant, um, quite frankly, a lot of hotels are very, very frustrated about the whole program. So, you know, I know that the Marriott's were trying to help some of these clients come into New York City, and it was so complicated. So, my recommendation would be, if you don't mind, maybe you can get together with VJ and then do a webinar and just uh, get all the hotels together and then maybe walk them through the process because we've tried several times and we said, you know what, we don't want to get involved with this. So that'd be very helpful. Yeah. All right, so, great. Yeah. Yeah. You know VJ, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. No problem. For the DMO and CVB grants, do you have a list of all the New York DMOs and CVBs that are we assured they all are made aware of this? They will be, yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, first and foremost, it's our TPA partners, one per county. And then there's the additional um, <laughs> CVBs and DMOs in addition to that. So that's a couple more. But yeah, we're, we're pretty in contact. We're on contact with them fairly regularly. Great. But yeah, we're making sure. We're also going to our trade organization partners, Nistia, Nishta. Um, you know. When Ross went to the big the New York State meeting in Westchester, he met um, separately with all of the DMOs that were there. And we had a very good turnout and right. went over the program almost like line by line Great. so that they can understand it. Yeah. So about two more weeks left before the deadline? No, no, no. For that one, uh, actually, the application will just be coming out at the yeah. end of June. Oh, okay. And so they'll have, uh, I can't remember if it's 30 or 60 days. But yeah. So that, but that's why we are encouraging everybody to go there now because the window to apply is pretty narrow, but that's because we want to get this money out as soon as possible. The longer the window, the longer until you can get the money. Um, and so we're keeping that window short, but that's why the guidelines are out now. So people can go out, they'll, everything's there except the application, including what's going to be on the application. So it's good to go now and plan your progress now. Somebody had a question uh, that they put in the chat just about the EDA competitive sub awards, if they're only available to DMOs and what about TPAs? But I yes, uh, TPAs, yes, uh, the TPAs that are DMOs, <coughs> they are. Uh, DMO is defined in the guidelines, destination marketing organization. Uh, that would include all of our TPAs and then some that aren't TPAs, like the, there's some, it's all very complicated. Um, I think you all know um, that under state law, um, every county uh, designates a TPA, a tourism promotion agency, for the purposes of matching funds. So each county has one. There are some areas of New York State, both county and regional, that have other destination marketing organizations in addition to those TPAs, and either of those are eligible, if that makes sense. And Ross, def Ross define the guidelines. Are they under that ESD the same link as the others? Just Correct. Look for that tab. I believe so, yes. Okay. We can send that around. Yeah. Okay. I also meant to mention, by the way, yeah. going back um, to the experiential, uh, because Christine was asking this. Uh, in past years, we have let uh, the TAC know um, where we would be on a given weekend, right. particularly here in New York, in case you're out and about. Um, so we'll uh, we'll sure. do that again Send and make sure schedule. you're Our first aware. is actually the 116th um, Cultural Festival. Uh, so we will be here to kick off the um, the experience in New York City, and then I'll uh, make sure Sarah gets the list. What percentage of your TPAs are not DMOs? None. None. All, all the all, all the TPAs are DMOs, okay. but we have a number of DMOs that aren't that are TPAs. Not TPAs. Right. Okay. Gotcha. I can't, I can't um, think of the Venn <laughs> diagram of the <laughs> circle and how it works, it. but yes. If then when I right. when I do the when I do these uh, <laughs> tourism orientations and conferences once in a while, this is what I get to do. We get a lot of questions yeah. about that because <laughs> yeah. it's unique in the state. I yeah. know what other state, state doesn't. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Nan. That was uh, Nan Marshan, who you uh, heard introduce herself early on uh, from U.S. Travel, and uh, Nan reached out to me a few weeks ago because she was going to be in the area and said we should get together. And it, I noticed it happened to be TAC meeting week. And I said, <laughs> boy, what a great opportunity a, for Nan to meet the TAC and more importantly to hear from her. Um, and she was gracious enough to change her schedule a little bit and come in a little earlier to be with us today. Um, she is U.S. Travel Association Senior Director of National Councils, uh, which means she... Actually, that's 
No? No. Not anymore. <laughs> well, then I'll let you say your title. Okay. I will just say I work with Stan very closely. Uh, with through, the National Council. Right, through the National Council of State Tourism Directors, which is a sort of a loosely affiliated uh, coalition of uh, folks like me, the, yeah. the, the heads of the various state um, tourism offices all across the U.S. Um, and it's exciting to be a part of a group like that where you are both competitors and colleagues. Um, and tourism is one of those wonderful fields where a rising tide really does lift all boats. If you get somebody from <clears throat> Germany to come to the U.S. and love it, um, they're likely to come see you too, even if it's not on their current trip. Um, and it allows us to share best practices with each other, trends with each other, ask questions from each other, get data from each other. Um, but I also come in contact with NAN through IPW and ESTO and all kinds of other things. U.S. travel is uh, a, a such an important resource to us at I Love New York, um, and we're thrilled to have NAN with us today. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ross. And so my official title at U.S. Travel, uh, and we are a trade association, so we wear many hats. So, yes, I do work with the NCSCD, but um, my official capacity is I'm the senior vice president of membership and industry relations and also the general manager of ESTO. So everything that's member facing, that's why our councils, our committees and our member engagement communities, I, I probably touch all of them. And the state, uh, the NCSCD, as we call them, is truly unique and that they are DMOs, but on a state level, their needs are really, really specific and different than, Valerie, what you may be yep. <laughs> doing in your DMO. Uh, so it, it is a, a unique group, and I do enjoy working with them. I know that you hear from U.S. travel rather frequently, so I'm not going to rehash and talk about who we are, what we do, but just really want to focus on a few things, and that's some new uh, elements that we're doing, some policy and work that we're focusing on, um, focus around primarily international meetings, uh, meetings and business events, making sure that that is uh, healthy in this country, and also one of our newer long-term initiatives, the future of travel mobility. But also, first and foremost, to thank the state of New York because this state has always um, very uh, engaged with us. And also, uh, when we ask for something, you guys deliver in spades. Uh, and your activations are always really cool. For example, Global Meetings Industry Day on April 7th is one day where we, uh, the Meetings and Business Coalition, started that to recognize the importance of meetings and business events uh, throughout the world. Uh, New York was the first uh, to light up buildings, whether it was Javits or the Empire State Building. You had great participation. GMIT this year, we had over 30 countries participation participate and over 40 million impressions we touched over 8.5 million people in that one day so really spotlighting the importance of meetings and business events not only globally but specifically in the u.s and we love using those new york pictures uh, on our websites and to promote gmid so thank you very much for all of that all also earlier this month we had national travel and tourism week which um again new york's Rep. Brian Higgins was one of the elected officials that uh, published a proclamation during National Travel and Tourism Week. And again, destinations always participate. Niagara Falls turns red for the, that time. So we um, enjoy that a lot. And thank you very much for your participation. One of the things that Ross touched on is international. And um, that is an area of la uh, laser focus for us from a policy standpoint. Um, we're working to ease travel restrictions. It's one of the first things that we have to do, including removing the pre-departure testing requirement. Um, you touched on IPW, and I'm happy to say that we have over 4,500 delegates this year, and 1,600 buyers and media are gonna be there. All the key markets that you touched on will be present, and we really feel that this is a great accomplishment this year because we don't have the traditional large delegations like China or Japan. So to be at 90% of pre-pandemic levels of buyers and media is really an accomplishment. And we will have a small group from Japan, obviously not China, some from Australia. So that's gonna be really, we said last year when we kicked off in Vegas, we were welcoming the world back, but it's really happening this year in Orlando in a few weeks. And uh, just while you're on that, what about Russia? Uh, I don't think we have anybody from Russia coming this year. So, yeah. okay. We do not have anyone. For, I can check, but I'm going to probably say we have no one from right. Russia coming this year. I don't know if you recall, but we were able to get $250 million uh, approved through federal funding for Brand USA. Um, that is a big 
WANs, you know, they're funded by ESTA. There have been no ESTA fees coming into this country. So that's going to allow them to work through their next fiscal cycle, which starts in the fall of this year through next year. And hopefully there we increase the ESTA fees are also increased from 10 to $17 also. And that's part of where this funding will come from. Uh, we just did a survey again on international with a morning consult in six international markets and more than half of the international travelers um, surveyed said that they would cancel a trip to the United States due to U.S. pre-departure testing requirements. It would have a big, uh, a huge impact on them coming to the U.S. That's why we're so focused on asking this administration to uh, lessen the requirements, um, also to prioritize traveling to destinations without the cumbersome entry visa requirements, the vaccination and hospital. We're asking foreign governments like UK, Germany, and Canada, they've all eliminated their pre-departure um, testing requirements for vaccinated travelers for COVID. So that's really what we're focusing on. A few weeks ago, we sent an industry-wide letter with more than 200 orga uh, 260 organizations from throughout the United States to uh, Dr. Zha, which is the new White House COVID-19 response coordinator, urging an immediate end to the pre-departure testing requirements. So that's really what we're focused on on international. It's getting rid of those pre-departure requirements for vaccinated visitors uh, to come into the United States and also to ease the backlog of visa applications. Right now it's 30 to 90 days to get a visa in some countries to come to the US and getting that backlog cleared up is critical because we're now May. If you want to come from Brazil and you need a visa, you're not going to get here till next spring just because of the backlog that we have in State Department. So our policy team is in touch with State daily. Um, and I'll pause right there if you have any questions about international. Yeah, so just so we're clear. So as of now with the pre-departure issues, they need to be vaccinated, but then they also need to have a test Pre, yes, to 48 to hours or so States. before. 24 hours. 24, 24 hours. hours. Okay, so you're we're advocating to get, get rid, rid of the of test, but not the vaccination. For vaccinated travelers to get rid of that pre-departure test to come into the United States. And non-vaccinated travelers, are they not allowed in? They or? are allowed in, but then they would have to take that test. Okay, so just for the vaccinated, you want yes. them to basically have a clearance. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so only test those on vaccinated. Correct. Okay. Correct. Do you know what other countries currently still require pre pre testing for vaccinations? Um, UK, Germany, Canada, Mexico do have, not do not anymore. We don't know who does. I I or, have, or, I'm I could, just wondering I if we're the sole. Out. I could try to find out <laughs> if we're the sole country that's still holding on to pre-testing, uh, which would make it. Canada actually released theirs just a few weeks ago. So <clears throat> yeah, and they were definitely they are stricter than us. It would be interesting to see what Australia is doing. I'll try to find out, mm -hmm. and I'll let you know, okay. Ross, and then you can share with your group because Australia has been one of the most restrictive, and if they've eased, even they, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so. That is something that we really feel this administration has to be vocal about and also to let people know that we're open to business and to visit. Um, I have another question to follow up on Christine about IPW. You weren't sure if it, um, any, you don't think any Russian tour operators are coming to IPW. Is that because they have not elected to come or are they not allowed to? I think yeah. there's a big difference for there's USTA to say you are, yeah. as an industry, we're not allowing you to visit. U.S. travel has not issued any sanctions or weaponized travel at all because of Ukraine. We have not taken a stand one way or another on that. I'm actually going to te text my text my colleague Malcolm and find out if we have any Russian tour operators. I don't think we do, but I will find out for sure before the end of this. I'm sure he'll get back. But it wouldn't be because we are saying no to any Russian tour operators. Interesting. So that means you would say yes if somebody did want to come. Yeah, we don't believe in weaponized travel. Yeah, but if I'm not mistaken, I think no flights are being allowed, being allowed into, into uh, U.S. from Russia. Russia. So, so that's not a, a yeah. U.S. travel sanction. That exactly. would be a sanction. Any other questions? And I know pre-COVID uh, and pre-Ukraine, 
we've never had that many Russian operators anyway. There were probably never less, never more than a dozen. Yeah, that, yeah that's that's beginning. that's regardless of the, I of think the market position. From it, New York, correct. was it was market. it was a growing it, market. It was a growing market, yeah. and also for California. When I was back there, it was a huge market for California, especially the, the luxury. But I, I I find it interesting. I'm as somebody who takes appointments. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I would feel if I had to have my cheery face to a Russian tour operator right now. Right. I don't know. I, I, I would. I would That's interesting. interesting. I'll, I'll see what he says if he goes back because he's already seen my text. Mm -hmm. um, very quickly on the meetings and business events and corporate travel front, U.S. Travel has had an initiative called Meetings Means Business for the last 10 years. That was done as a standalone coalition supported by industry dollars. Um, it was very clear to us through COVID that meetings and business events are key and crucial to a healthy hospitality industry in the United States. And that until all of our segments are um, fully restored, our industry as a whole isn't restored. Right now, Tourism Economics is uh, estimating that 2024, possibly 2025, when we'll have a whole industry again. And that obviously varies across the United States. I know New York, larger urban cities are definitely more impacted than other areas like say in Florida or Georgia who never shut down. So what we decided to do as an organization is we brought that initiative in house. It's no different than the attention we pay to international or domestic or national parks or <clears throat> transportation, for example. So it is a core feature of the work that we do on a policy level. And some of the things that we are trying to work on right now is, um, where's my text? I don't, policy stuff isn't my world. So I have to, I, I wanna make sure I do this correctly. Um, the legislation that we're working on is to change, to make a change in corporate policy budgets and new technologies. Um, one of our most important priorities that we're advocating for in Congress right now is to restore the deductibility of entertainment business expenses to spur recovery in the live entertainment, entertainment and event sectors, and to extend full expensing for business meals beyond 2022 to support recovery in the restaurant sector. Um, we're hoping that these incentives, uh, incentives could significantly help bolster the investment in corporate travel and meetings and business events. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's a huge part. We work very closely. In fact, Fred Dixon is the co-chair of the Meetings and Business Coalition. Jerry Saito has been involved for years and uh, we definitely engage with them on, on any issues that have to do with meetings and business events. And what, so those are the immediate things that we're focusing on among a lot of others, but you may not have heard about uh, the future of travel mobility, which is our long-term 10 year, 15, 25 year initiative where um, it's really rooted. This initiative is rooted in the intersection of travel, transportation and technology. Our industry needs to have a seat at that table at a federal level in each one of those areas. And we're, we're leaning into the trends that are gonna significantly impact travel and the industry in the decades to come. And we feel that those are the areas where they are rooted. Um, our core values and principles that we're applying to look at this work is obviously first, our mission is to support travel to and within the United States. So everything stems from that. The second is to unite the industry and command our collective voice in these areas to make sure that we're present in all of those sectors. Because an example on transportation, if we don't have a seat on the table, by 2030, EV vehicles are going to be all over the place. Is New York State equipped as a state to have charging stations, not only at rest stops, but convention centers and hotels and other areas? So making sure that from federal level, they understand the needs of hospitality and travel throughout the U.S. when it comes to initiatives that this that the feds are, are working on. Um, that also speaks to leaning into having uh, greater diversity and equity across our industry. It also leans into sustainability issues in our industry um, and as it's seen through the travelers, so also having a better understanding of consumer needs. So that's our future travel platform. It's really all about mobility, sustainability, a seamless, secure travel. Workforce is a big part of that. In fact, we are grappling with what workforce means from a US travel perspective. What can we impact? What can we do? Um, is, it, is it a policy play? Is it a, a PSA to consumers so that they understand the value of being part of this industry, of what the jobs that are available in the industry? We're doing a survey right now, a study with Gallup to try to get an understanding uh, or to really get our heads wrapped around what it is that we think, what some data that we can use and activate on that data to see where it makes sense for us 
or to partner with other industry associations and partners to see how we can tackle this. Because I gotta tell you, the last six weeks I've been traveling, it is the number one issue that we hear from, from ent entities, large and small. Um, so there'll be more information as we roll these things out. We share that with all of our members. We ask that our members also push that out to all of their constituents as well. And the last thing I'm going to bring up, as you all know, our leader and my boss, Roger Dow, is leaving at the end of July. And uh, I'm, I, for one, I think I'm just going to do a pool and see if anybody <laughs> wants, to, wants to know what's, uh, who's going to replace. So we're hoping to have a replacement announced in mid-July. We used to say July 1, but by the end of July, we're hoping to have a replacement announced. He's going to be missed. So, and yes, he will be missed. He's yeah, sure an incredible will. leader yeah. for this industry and really brought this industry to the table in Washington, D.C. And we were thrilled to have him come to uh, our state tourism conference that Nistia uh, hosted. Um, and he was great, as always. Uh, we've uh, The organization has named, I believe it is a Internship, oh, okay. an, internship, an internship, internship, an internship, paid internship in his name um, for uh, students to have a placement in the tourism industry here in New York. And, uh, he was excited by that honor. And we were thrilled to be able to give it to him. Right. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions. I do you have one. Yes, yes sure. Yeah. Well, it, it, actually, to be honest with you, it, might, it, it, it was on your on, on your behalf. I can't think, see your name. I'm sorry. But uh, relative to the meetings and conferences in the corporate, I participated in your travel, uh, not yours, but the Travel Advocacy Day in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I'm Greg, that. I'm Greg Marshall. It was a right. month or so ago, right? Yeah, the one in April. Our the feedback we got from the legislators and the staff we talked to was they were surprised that travel and tourism was having challenges. And, and I'm, I'm just wondering if, if your organization and collectively New York State is thinking about any type of consumer or legislative communication that really says travel and tourism isn't back. You know, I think really what we're hearing is full planes, full attractions, waiting lists. And the fact of the matter is the, the, there's a lot of traffic, but the money's not back. And there doesn't seem to be a communication. I'm not being critical. I just wondered if anybody's talking about that because it's significant it's going to really affect the hotels at some point on a cash flow from an elected official standpoint in washington dc at a federal level we're up there telling them that it's not all bad and that it's uneven yeah. the recovery is uneven and that's what we need to drive home were you uh, who, who were the elected officials that you saw on uh, our legislative staff for one of them okay. uh but but that was I the staff I mean, yeah i yeah. don't recall all uh, yeah well, you know, well, I we can go. Well, one thing I can do is I can go back to Nicole Porter, our PAC person, and say, Who did the New York delegation meet with? And some of the feedback was that recovery was here and everything's rosy, and it's not. So, whoever yeah. on our policy team are meeting with those elected officials on a regular basis uh, need to make sure that the message I know there's is. A direct thing, but my next yeah. door neighbor thinks everything is hunky dory, right? And yeah. I'm not positive that that's. From a consumer messaging standpoint, well, that's not really our role, but. Yeah. In a way, we're taking a look, we're reevaluating, is that our role when it comes to workforce? <clears throat> and is, is that something that we need to engage in? And how would we engage it? And how would we fund it? So, I yeah. I so, understand the challenges. Yeah. Certainly. So, but that, you know, I think it also starts on a local level from uh, not only on the Fed level, but also on lo GBAs, local members to their city councils. Yeah going up to the state level, because it's, I think the message is everybody's seeing the complaints about the full planes and all of that that's happening mm -hmm. and the prices because of revenge travel. But the reality is it's not, e it's, it's not an even recovery. Right. Uh, I have a question in regards to that. Is that also because there are less planes, less flights happening? Yes. And also when it comes to the hotels, I mean, I, a lot of hotels also closed. I mean, how many less beds do we have? Well, it's, I, I'll defer to, to George on that, but it's also a staffing issue. So right. I know, I know in some right. cities, but, but also hotels are open, but not the entire properties are right. 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 Also, but also a lot of smaller hotels did close. Mm -hmm. And have uh, not reopened, yeah. Uh, well, and maybe will never reopen. But there were a lot of openings, too. Was, okay. I, it's, I, I'd have to go back and check, but I, last I checked, uh, the availability is not much down except for workforce correct mm -hmm. the, the Work issue is that overall really the number of beds the number of beds available is down but that is not because of closures okay. it's because of workforce uh, workforce, yeah. and quite frankly we've been paying a lot of uh, 
overtime for the staff to work double shifts and whatnot. Um, I think since the pandemic, the Merrick Marquis, this weekend is the first time they're getting about 1,200 uh, folks from uh, Spain. And in fact, they've been postponing maybe three times already. You know, So it's the international business is not really there. Yes. Yes. And Nan, uh, can I ask you one last question? I know you're working on the uh, pre-departure testing. How about the um, uh, visa waiving countries? Are you still pursuing? Yes, we're still pursuing. Because last time I checked, sure. you were about maybe 39 countries now? 39 countries. Israel yeah. was the last country to be added. Oh, really? Uh, and I, um, I think, I, let me double check that, but yes, we're... I think it's as important or more important right now to Absolutely. fix the backlog mm -hmm. and then and then look at what are the other visa because you know there's a whole plethora of requirements to be considered based on uh, a lot of different sure. immigration status and issues so uh yeah definitely it's okay. a focus but we want to get that backlog fixed so that those that have the visas right now can at least travel um someone asked a question about airlines i that's uh a lot going on with airlines. There's availability of aircraft. Workforce is an issue for them as well. Availability of pilots is an issue. Cost of, fuel. Cost of fuel is going to be an increasing issue. <clears throat> Reallocation of flights based on the cost of fuel and workforce. So um, a lot going on. We work closely with A4A and try to assist where we have. And, and another thing you may remember, uh, the airlines were at our table and then were not at our table. Since COVID, they are back at our table. So we have the three legacy carriers who are actually involved with us um, at, at a, a fairly significant level and are part of our corporate CEO round table. But I think, I seem to think that the hotels are in better shape when it comes to airlines because we don't have to go through those FAA certifications, you know, so... Um, for the airlines with the um, their staff, they need to go through FAA certification. Each segment of industry has their challenges based on everything that's going on. You know, well, as a, as a state that a lot of our tourism is, is um, the drive market, um, so a lot of interstate tourism and tri-state tourism that we are concerned that the, the fuel um, surges, yeah. the price is really going to impact negatively on people driving to New York. So I don't know how much that's in the in messaging to the elected officials to try to, you know, pressure, you know, the gas reserves or whatever, whatever it takes to get those prices down. So tourism economics did a study last month and MMG White Global did a study about the price of fuel. The price of fuel doesn't stop drive market. They just reallocate their spend or they, they spend go, lower but days. They, or they but they, fewer, they'll right. go fewer so days they or they'll to reallocate. Buffalo, and they'll, they're going to go to they, right. they, may, they may still so. go to Buffalo, but they may not. They'll, they'll spend less days mm -hmm. or they'll stay at, a, a, at an economy property. Okay. It doesn't okay. stop okay. them from Correct. traveling. They just, how they spend their money while they travel. It also the changes. It, it also sort of changes where people might go as their destination, right. but it, it all sort of just is a domino effect yeah, a uh, in down. the way a trickle down is the best way to think of it, right? The, the New York Times actually just did an article on this yeah. um, that talked about the people who would be getting on a plane to go overseas are saying, oh, well, maybe we should stay local, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, okay. but anyway. Well, one thing I read this morning is the parity of the euro to the US dollar might spurn some more outbound travel. If, I mean, we're, we're, we're saying we're going to be at parity mm -hmm. within the next month or so. So that'll be interesting to see what dynamic that does wow. to outbound travel from the U.S. Particularly with Canada. Well, this was very interesting. Um, I do have one last question. I don't know how much um, U.S. travel plays with picking the cities for IPW or how far out it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I know that after, and I'm dating myself here, but after 9-11, we advocated for then powwow to come mm -hmm. to New York City. It wasn't until 2005 that it was able to come. But then you saw, you know, the upswing of the international mm -hmm. visitors that a lot of people track directly to powwow or yeah. IPW. So yeah. if there's any um, openings, let us know, because we I know that New York State would, okay. would really want to bid for that. So I know at the end of this year, I think we are through 2026. And I know they're going to start the next round. Okay. And we know, I know that we as a team, as a staff, would love New York because it is <laughs> such a huge draw. Um, it's, uh, we have to depend obviously on the state, on NYC and company, on the hotels, um, to, right. you know, on the big package and being able to meet with the requirements to do it. But I'll let Malcolm know that and um, 
right yeah i mean i always you know i have my hat on now of new yeah. york state not necessarily mm -hmm. new york city but if new york city is too expensive then you might even look at buffalo which could probably use a lot of help right now as far as positive you know getting people yeah. to when is the stadium yeah. supposed to be completed i'm sorry when is the stadium Do they have a convention center large enough for they the have stadium? a pretty big no when the stadium is completed we need a convention center. We yeah, need over we need over eight hundred thousand square feet of just convention oh, space. We have that at Javits. You, I know we have. Javits. know we have it at Javits. Javits is safe for the state. We're this year we're, at, we're about eleven hundred booths. Pre COVID, we were at about fourteen hundred booths. Mm -hmm. It's just a big footprint, and then rooms we use what ten or twelve hotels. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a huge it's a huge commitment from the city, and that may be why. You know, when things were on the upswing and the hotels were getting the rates and everything, the allocations weren't as easy to get. Or so what we need in midsummer, which we're usually in May or June, which is the travel so time. Buffalo has not made the. There's no city in New York that would meet the needs of IBW no. except New York. But the is Buffalo's not Buffalo making the stadium also a flex space into a convention center for no. that kind of? Yeah. I don't think any stadium works that way because you well, need individual when, rooms. Right, because well, when the Jets were going to, yeah, that uh, was, they were planning, they on, were planning on that. For yeah. Sure. That got, as you know, right. voted yeah. down <laughs> in Albany. Yeah. Fortunately. <laughs> yeah. So um, that doesn't mean you can't do pre and post stores throughout the state. Right, right. which, we did, IBW, which so. we did last time. And we, we partnered with a lot of um, airlines that did special pre and post flights from different countries. From, yeah, absolutely. Well, yep. So that was very successful for the entire state. It all you yeah. know, benefited. So, well, without any other questions, we want to thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for your time. Really thank insightful. You. Um, and now I, I know we're um, running a little bit late. Uh, but I do want to open up the floor to TAC members if you want to give us any updates on what's happening. Anything? Hey, yeah, Christine. Um, Jessica? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, yes. Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. And I do apologize. When you called my name earlier, I was having some technical difficulties, so I was not... Um, expecting a question and didn't quite hear what it was, but it is really um, timely for me to share um, NISCA's grant making opportunities for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, and for those of you joining us today who may not be familiar with NISCA, the New York State Council on the Arts funds the not for profit arts and culture sector, artists and organizations all across New York State. Um, and like tourism, arts and culture has um, suffered under the past two years of the pandemic, but we are making a comeback. Um, and it's exciting this week at NISCA because our application portal opens for fiscal year 2023 grant opportunities. Um, and those include, um, just very briefly, um, we've simplified our categories to be really responsive to the needs of the field and to grow access. These are two uh, of our major uh, priorities for the agency. Um, and the categories, support for organizations, support for artists, support for special opportunities, support for partnerships, and regrowth and capacity enhancement. So the application portal opened uh, through the 12th of July. Uh, and capital projects opportunity uh, it comes later this fall. So it is a really exciting time. Um, we've been doing uh, webinars for the field to understand all of our application opportunities and to really encourage uh, growth uh, from throughout the state and access. Uh, so uh, please join us at arts.newyork.gov. We're taping everything so that if uh, grantees or applicants haven't had a chance to join us live, they can tap in and learn everything possible about accessing these vital funds. So thanks for that. Terrific. And uh, Catherine, are you, um, I just want to make sure that you're aware with Shanique on the truck coming to the 116, right? Where is that exactly, the 116? Part of the festival. Where, uh, where is it in, or do we know? And we can, we can always email it out later. Um, yeah, I can give you the exact like cross street where the 
where our footprint will be located. Okay. Thank you. Any other new business that any of our guests would like to um, make us aware? I just have one question. I, it's Greg Marshall. Uh, I recall being at one of these meetings, either in person or online, and there was a lot of discussion, very encouraging, about an interagency task force that would work together. And I wondered where that stood today. I, and I say that because I was a speaker at the National Scenic Byways Conference, and there was a lot of transportation issues, et cetera. It is meeting quarterly. They are meeting. It, oh, is, good. Uh, it is made up of all the state agencies that touch on tourism. It's a couple dozen. Sarah yeah. oversees it. More. It's a couple of dozen agencies. Yes. Um, I mean, we have more formal meetings where it's about 18 state agencies. It's surprising the state agencies that actually touch tourism, DOT, the Department of Transportation, for instance, uh, participates, the Thruway Authority, obviously parks. And then regularly we have, um, you know, smaller group calls specifically with the Department of Environmental Conservation as they're getting their birding trail up and running. Um, we have calls with parks as they get these new facilities running. Um, especially throughout COVID too, because there was a lot of closures. We had to kind of coordinate on our website, how we were positioning folks to go visit like state land. So we are in um, constant contact with our state agencies. And as Ross said, the formal meetings are kind of, you know, more like the tech meetings where everybody will present what's happening, but we're always talking, um, you know, throughout the department, Shanique's team, uh, Anna's team, talking to other state agency partners. Thank you. Um, I, can't, I have some questions in regards to something we should, I think, talk about at another time, but something I just want to put out there, talking about New York State campgrounds in certain areas of the state, and the fact that if people don't know about them at certain times of the year, that they're out of luck for the entire season for camping. So. For instance, like Lake George Islands, for instance. If you don't get on the website that first week, right. there's absolutely no, almost no possibility of getting to camp for, because they sell out, right. because they, they sell, sell out yeah. immediately. But there are other places like, for instance, up in the Catskills, I think it's Peekamoose Blue Hole, mm -hmm. where you only can book two weeks in advance. So it gives more of an opportunity for people to, um, to book, but you also can't plan. Right. Um, so it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the answer is, um, but there is, there, there's, there's an issue there. So those people that can't plan that far in advance, right? But there's also the, yeah. the, but there's also those that can't not plan that far in advance. They're also just don't know. And so when you've got people that just don't know that they have to get on in, gosh, I think it's six months ahead of time. Yep. And they have to be on on that day to get places that they want to be. Um, and again, in a climate that is uncertain like it has been now, um, I think it's very unfortunate for a, a great deal of people, especially those that are newcomers to the outdoors especially because then they're not going to be able to take advantage of the some of the most beautiful properties that the state has to offer the only thing i know because you brought up peekamoose and it's a state-owned property that dec manages and i don't know if this is just you well, that know, one's individual. About, well, that's a that good. one's over tourism so they right. they actually don't promote they they do that because they don't really want people to go there um they right. have a but, lot but of i'm saying that's like every two weeks the, the, right. the way it works makes it available to a lot of varieties of people mm -hmm. right and it actually works yeah um whereas other places you know if you don't do it six months in advance mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to go right well, let's yeah, we'll check. That. We'll and check with our sister agencies that run it. Yeah, okay. and make sure we have the information on the website so people know if that's how it is. Then they know in advance, and we'll help to promote it. We did just run a blog. Uh, we did run a blog uh, in early spring. So we ran a blog in early spring that was about uh, places to close down. That ran everything from the Hamptons to camping. We specifically called out camping. Um, and there was a 
number of different things because that's true of a lot of different places. Um, right. Um, right. And yeah, that's true of a lot of things too, right? right. Uh, but uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to do. Right. Yeah. So, guys, can I just have your attention? Okay. I don't know if you have. Something you want to add, Tom? Did you want to talk about trains or anything? Or always want to talk about trains. But you had a question <laughs> at the at the New York State, uh, so I just well, wanted you to have the I mean, opportunity. Uh, to there's have a lot it of things, a lot of changes going on. Um, Amtrak is uh, scheduled to get sixty six billion dollars. Um, I think you know the way it works is that the states buy for money. Um, I would encourage I Love New York to have a dialogue with DOT to help. Uh, you know, with the grants. Um, there are some challenges, um, as I've been uh, mentioning to people with New York by rail, uh, we're not on the seatbacks anymore. So I'm trying to get some support. Rich and Ross have mentioned that they would try to help. They feel it's important. Um, you know, once you're out, you're out and it's hard to get it back in. Um, so I do appreciate, you know, the, the support, but I do believe that the future of rail is very promising. Um, I think New York, um, you know, has to step up its game, and I would, you know, encourage I Love New York to, uh, you know, get involved in those discussions, either through their interagency discussions or, you know, uh, elsewhere. Thank you. I will tell you, I did a little research myself on the seatbacks, um, and I wanted to see how the airline industry was handling it because they don't have magazines now, in-flight magazines. A lot of them have done away with them. And Nan, to your point about redistribution of of weight. <laughs> Because of the fuel costs, I mean, this is what we learned is that they are cutting back on the in flights oh, oh. Uh -huh. because they're so heavy to carry. Uh, so it's I don't think that ha I don't think that's the same issue with with train travel. But I just thought it was yeah. it was an interesting thing that I learned to share with changing, you. Yeah. yeah. So um, it seems like digital is what the airlines are pushing. I don't know. Alexis is on the line. I don't know if yeah. you want to share anything with JetBlue, if JetBlue is planning on going back to in-flight at all, in-flight magazines. Alexis Sinclair. Alexis. There we go. We're gonna Hi, I'm here. You guys cut out for a second. Now we've unmuted yeah. you. Go ahead. No, I'm so sorry you cut out. Can you say it again? I've heard the digital part, uh, but what I yeah, just as far as in-flight magazines, you know, we have, we're learning about how airlines are maybe not going to return that means of communication. So we were just curious about that. If you had heard anything with uh, United, um, oh, I haven't heard that we'll be changing it. We still have hemispheres on the airline monthly, so I my understanding is that will continue, and I can find some more information out as well. All right, before we wrap, last chance. Anybody have a question, comment? I have an answer to a question. You have an answer. We love that. That's there even better. There are no than Russian uh, tour operators or media coming to IPW. Okay. All right. Um, that being said, I just need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. And a second. Oh, now that George is in. George. All right. Oh. We're going to give George the, uh, the honor of, of seconding. Okay. Uh, so I'm supposed to say the time of this meeting officially adjourned, which is 1238. Thank you all. Our next meeting um, <laughs> said before the adjournment, but is Monday, September 19th at 11 a.m. We are planning on having that meeting also in person, but check your email because we are looking at having it on uh, location someplace, which will make it a little bit more exciting. Not that this is an exciting coming back. And when you say when you, when you say a location someplace. <laughs> Um, stay tuned. Stay, stay tuned. tuned. <laughs> Ross, in somewhere in New York. Somewhere in New York State. Somewhere Some, in New York, maybe possibly outside of New York City. No, uh, we have um, a location in New York City that really would like to host us, okay. and it's a question Great. of whether or not they have the dates for it. I mean, I don't think it's a secret. Mm -hmm. We talked about it on an earlier meeting, right. but we're hoping to go to the Javits Center because they also want to give a tour of the farm that Great. we mentioned oh, and, great. and all of the new um, space. It was my first time going back when I went to the NYC and Company Annual Meeting, and I was very impressed with the new space. So, um, but it's a question of what meeting they have during that period of time, whether or not they'll have the space for us to come. If in. not, we should have it up in Kingston at the Hotel Park. 
right? There's Remember a, that all our meetings must be live streamed, so we must have the technical capabilities. But we'll be on the lookout. Or Lego Land, we had talked about that too. Like <laughs> keep those <laughs> ideas flowing. But there has to be a, 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 a room yeah. somewhere in sure. Kingston. That oh yeah, somewhere. Cool. Yes, sure. I, I think we need to have some of those apple fries too, Ross, at the next meeting. <laughs> The only challenge is uh, that's UN General Assembly week, so oh. outside of New York may be challenging for. Oh, that's true. Good to know. Oh, is that a good week to actually have that we meeting? Will, I, well, we've we've run into this before, and I think the fact that it's on a Monday, I think, is why it makes it a little bit easier. I know that in the past we we've, we've struggled with that, but by having it on the Monday, it seems to work out okay. And being on the West Side. That week is probably also a very good thing. It Rather could be than, better than true. being here than being right here because this being way. right here that week is oh, it. very yeah. difficult. Because right. everything's closed down mm -hmm. over on the side of the. Well, isn't that a great problem to have again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I kind of missed that problem, problem you know. Yeah. But um, so right. thanks everybody, and and Thank you, enjoy your summer, and please keep New York State on your itineraries. We hope to see you out there. Congratulations Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.